on ESPN. Welcome you back to our studio with you commercial free for the next 14 minutes. Came on a special time today, and that is because at the top of the hour, we are heading to UFC's Fight Island on ESPN and on the ESPN app. 9 a.m. Eastern, we lead it up to the main event featuring top 10 welterweights Michael Chiesa and Neil Magny. But we're commercial free here on Get Up until then, and we have significant breaking news just into our newsroom moments ago. Philip Rivers has announced that he is retiring from the National Football League after 17 sensational seasons as a quarterback. 16 of them, of course, in San Diego or then Los Angeles with the Chargers and then played this last year with Indianapolis. I just jotted down a few quick numbers here. He started the last 240 games of his career. That's the second longest streak by an NFL quarterback ever behind only, of course, Brett Favre. He's 39 years old. He finishes fifth all-time in yards passing and fifth all-time in touchdown passes. Um, he has a standing offer to go become a prep school coach. He's going to go coach high school football in Alabama. It's what he's wanted to do, and he is now going to go do it. So, again, Philip Rivers, after 17 seasons, announcing his retirement. Dominique, you would have gone up against him directly. Yes, what can you yeah. tell us about playing against Philip Rivers? Yeah, I played against him all the way back in college when he was at NC State, and he had that unorthodox, unusual throwing motion, but somehow it was always effective, and it was really uh, nice to see his career end on a somewhat positive note. I know they lost, but he played well in that game throughout much of the season where he was up and down. So Phillip Rivers is obviously going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer, even though he's never gotten to that um, Super Bowl, never won a Super Bowl, or never even played in the Super Bowl. But throughout all this time, he's been one of the best quarterbacks in the league and uh, had a tremendous career. So uh, it's going to be incredibly interesting if someone has a camera on him while he's while he's coaching high school football because he is an animated guy who doesn't curse. So you don't have to worry about that. But he is an animated Animated, intense competitor, and it's going to be funny watching him trying to influence a game when he has no other influence after uh, the opening kickoff. He will always be remembered, I think, in a number of ways. One of them as a member of the legendary 2004 quarterback class. Yes, he was uh, the second quarterback taken in that class, actually drafted by the Giants and then traded on the day of the draft for Eli Manning. But Eli was in that draft and Ben Roethlisberger in that draft. Now, Ben, the only one left. D. Wood, what, what would you say about Phillip Rivers as a player? Oh, man, I have so much. I always respected Phillip Rivers from afar, just the energy. Um, one of the toughest competitors that we've seen um, coming to the National Football League uh, at the quarterback position. He's all, you know, like Dominique said, was always animated. And, you know, this was a guy that, you know, he, like he would throw an interception and he would just keep slinging it. No question. He wouldn't back down from anyone. And, uh, he, you know, he's had a tremendous career over you know, playing with the San Diego Chargers and, and, and ultimately ending with the Indianapolis Colts. And like I said, I just, I respect his career so much, man, because of the energy he brought to the field each and every, each and every game. So my head, you know, I tip my head to Phillip Rivers, tremendous career. Yeah, and if the most important ability in football is availability, again, he started the last 240 yeah. games of his he career. He played on a tournament. ACL, didn't he? At one point, didn't he, he play a in the Super Bowl? Tour, excuse ACL. me. Mm -hmm. He played in the AFC Championship game six days after tearing his ACL, played and lost to New in England Foxborough. in that game. Uh, I was just reading the story about that, actually, as I was going through as many notes as I could during our break as we got the news here. Um, but that was the only AFC Championship game that he got to during his career. And again, played six days after tearing his ACL and, and ultimately lost that game to the Patriots. Graziano, there's... I hate to even take the subject away from him directly, but his retirement in Indianapolis does open an interesting door for a really good team with a lot of really good players that now needs a quarterback. And people will start looking to Carson Wentz in Philadelphia because of the history of the relationship hmm. with the coach Frank Reich, now the head coach in Indianapolis, who was his guy in Philly when he was at his best. What do you expect the Colts to do? Yeah, look, they'll cast a wide net. They were in the same position last year, right? A, a ready-made team, a good a playoff caliber team needing a quarterback, and they're going to be that again. Uh, there was a Rivers-Frank Reich connection from Reich's time in San Diego, so that made sense. People will make the Wentz connection. I, the Eagles at this point aren't interested in moving Wentz. We'll see what develops as the offseason goes along. But uh, there will be options. There will be interesting options on the quarterback market. We've talked about the possibility of guys like Jimmy Garoppolo being available, Matthew Stafford being available. You know, the, the Colts will have 
uh, options. But Green, do you mind? I mean, do you mind? I, I have some memories of Philip Rivers personally. I, I do think I, this was as a reporter. This was a man who was consistently generous with his time and insight. And, and I know I always appreciated that. And I know a lot of colleagues of mine have said the same thing. Just an incredibly genuine uh, individual who, who felt things deeply. Like he, he I feel, he, I'm sure he still does. When I talk about as a, as a football player, it meant a lot to him. And I know it tears him up that he didn't win a Super Bowl. But you know, the, the feeling that he always had for his teammates, for his team, for, for the effort he would put in to be great. When you talk to Philip Rivers, uh, you have to block out some time. He's an effusive individual who has a lot to say uh, and cares about the people around him. And I think, you know, he's a guy that uh, will be missed by a lot of people in a lot of uh, in a lot of levels of football. Go ahead, Nate. Well, as, as a player, as a player, I understand all that effusive praise you have for him, for him being so generous as, to the reporters. But as a player, good riddance. Like the man <laughs> was very yeah. was, was far was far too good and also far too arrogant. And he would talk trash in your face after he threw a touchdown. So I have a ton of respect for him. And that's part of the respect <laughs> that I have for him is as a defender, not sad to see him go. The man was an excellent football player and also a hell of a trash talker. So, so yes. very annoying with his dag gummits and gosh daggets. Like, just, <laughs> just say what you want to say. Say the word that you want to say. Yeah, he didn't say the word. We did a feature on him. We, we, we did a feature on him a couple years ago. It's run a few times on our network about the trash talking quarterback who doesn't swear and what does he say instead. And there's all this great footage of him, like, you know, that, that, cursing guys out without cursing, right? Where he's just getting in guys' faces <laughs> and talking about. So yeah, he leaves he leaves that <laughs> legacy as well as the the all time trash talking quarterback. I would say it's a stone cold lead pipe lop. You're going to hear a lot of that today as we continue our coverage of this on ESPN. Right. And I, I think when we think back to when they lost that playoff game and we saw him get very emotional afterwards, that was the first time I got a sense. He knows it's over. He knows that was his last game. You sort of had a feeling then as he was crying, tearing up after it, that he knew he waited a week or two. And now here it is. So again, Philip Rivers, Hall of Fame career, 17 seasons. He announces today that he is going to retire. Meanwhile, next order of business, Patrick Mahomes was 21 of 26 for 225 yards and two scores in what was his most efficient passing game of the season. On the other side, Josh Allen had a rough day, just 122 yards, his lowest number this year on barely over 50% passing to go along with a pick and just a single touchdown. So that was a very bad night. Now, the Bills have been outstanding ever since that game. And, D. what I know you put together a tape to give us an area of growth for Josh Allen since these teams went head-to-head. -head. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, Greeny, you talked about, you touched upon Josh Allen, and one of the things that he's really, really improved upon this year has been his accuracy. And if you look right here, this is a game that was in inclement weather, but Josh Allen, this is a play, you know, here it is right here with, with Stephon Diggs. That's a touchdown any other game. And you can see the inaccuracy on that pass. That's not the Josh Allen that, we, that we've been seeing all season. Fast forward to the wild card round. Look at the... Look at the accuracy on this play to Stephon Diggs again, throwing in a tight window, perfect pass to Stephon Diggs. That's where Josh Allen has really been outstanding throughout this whole year. And that one game, was it just didn't show what Josh Allen had been doing all season. So I don't expect him to, to have any type of game uh, similar to what he had against that week six game against, uh, against the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, our friend Ryan Clark refers to it as his arm arrogance. That's how good he's been throwing the football. <laughs> mm. But Dominique... He's also a guy, and certainly when he came into the league, everyone talked about his ability to run with the ball. And while we haven't seen as much of that, could be a big factor on Sunday. I expect it to be. I hope they do. They, they had a few design runs in that game against the Chiefs that worked out quite well. But not only that, what he's done in the playoffs, though Brian Dayball is getting a lot of credit for scheming some things up, what he's done in the playoffs when it comes to buying time in the pocket and then connecting downfield to guys, that's been really impressive. His accuracy throughout that, while on the run to his right, hitting the right spot on the sideline to make sure those things are completed. Like, that's what's been more impressive than anything. And everyone kind of knows what you're going to go to. They're going to take away some of your key plays. And the athleticism of Josh Allen and his accuracy while on the run, I think that's going to be a difference maker if they're going to be able to move the ball and make big plays against this Chiefs defense. Now, Graziano, the first week of December, Mr. Hembo and I put together an essay in which we talked about how the Bills have the best formula to beat Kansas City. Now, that doesn't take into account whether Mahomes plays this weekend or not, but the formula they have feels like the right one to beat the Chiefs. I know you pick up on that thought. 
Yeah, the two prongs of that, if I recall, were that they can match the Chiefs in terms of explosive plays and that they can sustain long touchdown drives. It's not about winning time of possession. It's about, you know, keeping the Chiefs offense on the sideline and scoring touchdowns at the end of that drive. The Bills have the ability to do that. Look, you know, that, that game, the first game against the Chiefs, Greeny, was in the middle of a stretch where the Bills offense wasn't going great. They had 16, 17, 18 points three weeks in a row. Remember, the next week they beat the Jets with only field goals. So I talked to Josh Allen a couple weeks later when things were going better, and he said defenses had adjusted the way they were playing him, play a little bit deeper zones, and it took him a while to readjust to that. But obviously, given the way they've scored points ever since, it looks like he has. And much like we were discussing with the Packers a few minutes ago, I think the Bills' confidence as an offense is in a lot different place than it was in week six. For good reason, but Dominique, I will bring this up. One of the key factors always in long time of possession, ball control kind of drives is running the football, and the Bills didn't right. do it at all. They didn't even really try to do it against the Ravens last weekend. Can they get away with that Sunday? That was my point at the beginning. They didn't have Moss. They had him, and they only had one running back. But you know what? You got another running back, and his name is Josh Allen. He's just as big and just as strong as the other running backs that you have, if not bigger and stronger. So I know that you want to keep your players safe, and after seeing Patrick Mahomes get hurt on a speed option last week, maybe some people would be a bit sheepish about running their quarterback. But you know what? This is the championship round, and Josh Allen needs to run the ball because that makes their, their offense a lot more dynamic and impossible to stop because he has the arm strength and accuracy all of a sudden to attack downfield and he can run just about as good as anyone in the league not named Lamar Jackson. Isn't it ironic and, and frankly an outstanding illustration of how well they've developed the young quarterback that the questions about him when he came in were can he throw the ball and now the question we're asking <laughs> is will he run the ball on Sunday in the biggest game of his life. We will see it should be fascinating. We have much more football as we go.